I welcome our today's guest, Almanac of Naval Ravikant, a guide to wealth and happiness. It is going to answer questions on how to become wealthy in the 21st century. Here is my first question. Is it possible for ordinary people like me to become wealthy? If yes, how? Well, it wasn't possible for a very long period of human history, but it is now very much possible. The best place to start is to ask yourself, what kind of leverage do you have? If you study human history, you always notice a similar trend, rich versus poor, white collar versus blue collar, but that is no longer the case. Today in a world dominated by technology, it is leveraged versus unleveraged. Let me get into the details. Historically, there have been two broad classes of leverage. The oldest form of leverage is labor, other people working for you. For instance, in ancient Egypt, pharaohs ruled over people not just because they had money, but they could do it because people accepted them as gods and were willing to submit themselves to their whims. In ancient Egypt, the pharaoh was often seen as a divine ruler, closely associated with the gods. He was considered the earthly embodiment of a deity and his rule was believed to be divinely ordained. This religious belief in the pharaoh's divine right to rule made it difficult to challenge or question his authority. Of course, there were other factors such as providing stability, total economic control, etc. But the major factor was to keep people under their authority. The pharaohs often used art, inscriptions and monumental architecture to promote their authority and divine status. These visible displays of power helped reinforce the idea that the pharaoh was the rightful ruler and a symbol of national unity. It still exists in animals even though they do not have any religious beliefs. In chimpanzees, chimps who sit at the top of the hierarchy typically have the most leverage in terms of resource access, mate choice and influence over group choices. In chimpanzees, the only way to climb the social hierarchy is to form social alliances and get other chimps to support you. Anyway, let's come back to humans. I would argue that the labor is the worst form of leverage that you could possibly use. Managing people is incredibly messy. You are just one short hop away from a mutiny or getting eaten or torn apart by the mob. It requires tremendous leadership skills or you can say an insane level of propaganda just like the one ancient Egypt's pharaohs used. Which is by the way next to impossible these days. People now are well informed. Even social hierarchies in chimpanzee groups are not fixed and they can change due to various factors including physical abilities, alliances and the outcomes of conflicts. So yeah, it's pretty outdated. The second form of leverage is money. It is more modern. We all know how influential it can be. It has probably been the dominant form of leverage in the last century. You can see this by looking at the richest people. It's bankers, politicians in corrupt countries who print money and essentially people who move large amounts of money. If you look at the top of the very large companies, the CEO job is really a financial job. If you get good at managing capital, you can manage more and more capital much more easily than you can manage people. So in terms of leverage, money is far better than labor. But I will tell you one even better, one that anyone can gain. You don't have to be influential or rich. This brand new form of leverage is the most democratic form. It is called permissionless leverage and you can gain it by building products with no marginal cost of replication. This includes books, media, movies and coding. Zero marginal cost of reproduction means duplication is free. You just have to create it once and you can keep making money from it. Coding is probably the most powerful form of permissionless leverage these days. All you need is a computer. You don't need anyone's permission. This new form of leverage evolved very slowly in the last few hundred years. It all started with the printing press. It accelerated with broadcast media and now it is really blown up with the internet and with coding. Now you can multiply your efforts without involving other humans and without needing money from other humans. For instance, my book is a form of leverage. Long ago, I would have had to sit in a lecture hall and lecture each of you personally. I would have maybe reached a few hundred people and that would have been that. But today, through podcasts and ebooks, I can reach millions of people easily. This newest form of leverage is where all the new fortunes are made, all the new billionaires. For the last generation, fortunes were made by capital. The people who made fortunes were the Warren Buffetts of the world. But the new generation's fortune are all made through code or media. For instance, the world's most popular podcast is the Joe Rogan Experience. Joe Rogan makes $50 million to $100 million a year from his podcast. Then there is PewDiePie. I don't know how much money he is rolling in, but he's bigger than the news. 
and of course there is Jeff Bezos, Mark Zuckerberg, Larry Page, Sergey Brin, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs. Their wealth is all code based leverage. The most interesting thing to keep in mind about these new forms of leverage is they are all permissionless. They don't require somebody else's permission for you to use them or succeed. For labor leverage, somebody has to decide to follow you. For capital leverage, somebody has to give you money to invest or to turn into a product. Coding, writing books, recording podcasts, tweeting, YouTubing, these kinds of things are permissionless. You don't need anyone's permission to do them and that's why they are very egalitarian. They are great equalizers of leverage. They can certainly help us in dealing with inequality. Every great software developer for example now has an army of robots working for him at night time while he or she sleeps. After they have written the code and it keeps working 24-7. Ok so basically you mean to create wealth one must build some code based product or create some kind of content. But where do people who have jobs fit in there? The corporate employees. Would it be impossible for them to build wealth? Of course with their day job they can have a side hustle and create content. That is a different story. What I am asking is can people who have corporate jobs gain leverage? If yes, how? If you want to become the highest paid person in your field you just need to understand two things. The relationship between inputs and outputs and the importance of accountability. Now all the great authors and their books have taught us that you are never going to get rich renting out your time. And it's 100% true. But here is something no one talks about. At your job or in your chosen profession, if inputs and outputs are highly connected then it is going to be very hard to make money for yourself. If I was chopping wood or carrying water for you, you knew 8 hours put in would be equal to about 8 hours of output. So inputs and outputs are highly connected there. So no space for building wealth or getting extraordinary returns. The higher the creativity component of a profession, the more likely it is to have disconnected inputs and outputs. Your unique ability to create can be your leverage. A good software engineer just by writing the right little piece of code and creating the right little application can literally create half a billion dollars worth of value for a company. Maybe it took him a year or a month to create that software or application but he got astonishing returns for it. Inputs and outputs are totally disconnected there. It took just two weeks for Mark Zuckerberg to develop the initial version of Facebook. That was his input and we all know what kind of output he got from that. Humans evolved in societies where there was no leverage. Now we have invented leverage through capital, cooperation and technology. As a worker you want to be as leveraged as possible. So you can have a huge impact without as much time or physical effort. A leveraged worker can outproduce a non-leveraged worker by a factor of 1000 or 10,000. If you are a leveraged worker, your creativity and the value of your judgment become far more important than how many hours you work or how hard you work. Number 2. Find a job where accountability is high. Let us take the real estate business as an example. The worst kind of job is someone who is doing labor to repair a house. Maybe you get paid $10 or $20 an hour. You go to people's houses, your boss demands you are there at 8 am and you repair your piece of the house. Here you have zero leverage. You have some accountability but not really because your accountability is to your boss, not to the client. You don't have any real specific knowledge since what you are doing is labor lots of people can do. You are not going to get paid a lot. You are getting paid minimum wage plus a little bit for your skill and your time. The next level up might be the general contractor working on the house for the owner. They may be getting paid $50,000 to do the whole project. Then they are paying the labor $15 an hour and they are keeping the difference. A general contractor is obviously a better place to be. But how do we measure it? How do we know it's better? Well we know it is better because this person has some accountability. They are responsible for the outcome. They have to sweat at night if things aren't working. Contractors have leverage through laborers working for them. They also have a little bit more specific knowledge. How to organize a team, make them show up on time and how to deal with city regulations. The next level up might be a real estate developer. A developer is someone who is going to buy a property, hire a bunch of contractors and transform it into something higher value. They probably have to take out a loan to buy a house or go to investors to raise money. They buy the old house, tear it down, rebuild it and sell it. Instead of $50,000 like the general contractor or $15 an hour like the laborer, the developer might be able to make a million dollars or a half a million dollars in profit when they sell the house for more than they bought it for. 
including the expenses of construction. But now notice what is required from the developer, a very high level of accountability. The developer takes on more risk, has more accountability, has more leverage and needs to have more specific knowledge. They need to understand fundraising, city regulations, where the real estate market is headed and whether they should take the risk or not. It is more difficult. So choose a profession or be in a job where accountability is high and where you are responsible for the outcome. The more accountability, the more money you make. What you want in life is to be in control of your time. You want to get into a leveraged job where you control your own time and you are tracked on the outputs. If you do something incredible to move the needle on the business, they have to pay you, especially if they don't know how you did it because it's innate to your obsession or your skill or your innate abilities. They are going to have to keep paying you to do it because they don't know how to do it. Okay, so what I understood is that high paying jobs are usually where inputs and outputs are disconnected where you have to create something and use your creativity and where accountability is high, you are responsible for the outcome. But what is this specific knowledge you keep mentioning? We already discussed two important aspects. Is the specific knowledge the third leg of the tripod? <laughs> yeah, you can call it that. Specific knowledge is just as important, but it is a bit tricky. You see, specific knowledge cannot be taught. It can only be learned through experiences. When I talk about specific knowledge, I mean figure out what you were good at when you were a kid. Something you did not even consider a skill but people around you noticed. Your mother or your best friend growing up would know. The specific knowledge is sort of this weird combination of unique traits from your DNA, your unique upbringing and your response to it. It is almost baked into your personality and your identity. Once you identify it, you can work on it. Specific knowledge is detailed context-rich information or expertise in a specific area. It involves knowing the ins and outs of a particular field, subject or skill to a level that goes beyond the surface. It is often developed through years of focused learning and practical experience. Specific knowledge is the kind of expertise that can make an individual highly sought after or a recognized authority in a particular niche. Yeah, I think I know something about this. Regarding this, there is a book that has helped me immensely and actually can help people to identify their passion and then build specific knowledge. It's Mastery by Robert Greene. This book explores the path to mastery in any field, emphasizing the development of specific knowledge and skills through a combination of learning, practice and mentorship. In this book on page number 29, author Robert Greene mentions five strategies to help you discover your life's calling, your passion. Out of these five strategies, strategy number one helped me the most. The primal inclination strategy, returning to your origins. Every one of us is born unique. Our uniqueness is encoded in our DNA. You are a one-time phenomenon in the universe, my friend. Your exact genetic makeup has never occurred before, nor will it ever be repeated. This genetic uniqueness first expresses itself in your childhood through what's called primal inclinations. Every child is inclined to enjoy and completely immerse himself in certain activities. Some enjoy sports, some enjoy science and some arts. When Albert Einstein was a kid, his father gifted him a compass. Einstein instantly became fascinated by the idea that some invisible magnetic force was making the needle change its direction. It touched him to the core and he spent the rest of his life trying to discover more of such hidden mysterious forces of nature. Well, Einstein was smart and lucky enough to keep himself connected to his childhood fascinations, in other words, his primal inclinations. Most are not that lucky. What goes wrong with them is this. As we grow up, we lose our uniqueness due to the societal pressure imposed on us by our parents, teachers and friends and relatives. Parents, for instance, seek to direct you to a safe, comfortable and lucrative career path. As a human being, you are a social creature. You strive hard for acceptance. You seek people's approval. You try to fit in by conforming to what other people think is right and slowly you keep losing your uniqueness. Your interest and your decisions get influenced by society. That is why it is so important to reconnect with your childhood inclinations because they are not infected by the desires of other people. They are uniquely yours. They belong to you, no one but you. To reconnect, take your mind back to your childhood days and look out for the activities that you enjoyed the most. Now before I summarize this entire episode for you, let me tell you that on the Wisdom Podcast, I ask questions to the world's greatest books on business, entrepreneurship and personal growth. And the books answer my questions. They really do. So on this podcast, you get to experience the magic of books that speak. Anyway, here's the summary. 
We started our discussion by understanding how leverage works. Gone are the days when only the rich and influential people could use their leverage to build wealth. Now with the help of technology, anyone can gain leverage and with its help, build wealth. This brand new form of leverage is permissionless leverage where you don't need anyone's permission to start your business. You just need a laptop and a good internet connection. It's coding, creating content, building apps and so on. Then we discussed how someone can become the highest paid person in his or her field. For that you need to find a job where one, inputs and outputs are disconnected, which happens mostly in professions that require a certain level of creativity. Jobs where you work for 8 hours and get the same 8 hours of output are not good for making money. Number two, get a job where accountability is high and where you are responsible for the outcome. But to get a job like that, one must have specific knowledge, which by the way cannot be taught, can only be learned through experiences. Something that most people find difficult to do, yet you do it effortlessly. Then we discussed a few strategies to identify such areas in your life, areas where you can dominate. This is most important. If someone can train other people how to do something, they can easily replace you. And now with the rise of AI, this has gone one step further. If they can train you to do it, then they will eventually train the computer to do it. That is why it is important to know what you can do better than most people. Finding out your innate abilities. You get rewarded by society for giving it what it wants and doesn't know how to get it elsewhere. If you have specific knowledge, you have accountability and you have leverage, they have to pay you what you are worth. If they pay you what you are worth, then you can get your time back. You can be hyper efficient. 40 hour work weeks are a relic of the industrial age. Knowledge workers function like athletes, train and sprint, then rest and reassess. That's it for today's episode. On this podcast, intellectuals and curious individuals who are on a journey to become successful come to get answers to the most important questions on entrepreneurship, business and personal growth. See you in the next episode of the Wisdom Podcast.